a thousand bucks and the iPhone 13 Pro is still stuck at USB 2 speeds, never mind the $1,100 iPhone 13 Pro Max. Why? Because Lightning. And Lightning has pretty much been stuck at USB 2's half a gigabit per second since 2012. That, in spite of Apple adding 10-bit ProRes HDR recording back in September, with hardware acceleration fast enough to encode six gigabytes per minute and a new storage system fast enough to save it, but no, no is in nothing approaching a new IO system, nothing actually fast enough to transfer it. So you can now record the absolute highest quality video of any phone on the planet. You just can't get it off faster than the cheapest phone on the block, any faster than hitting that subscribe button and bell so we can build the best community in tech together. So. What do you do? I mean, besides hitting that button and cursing in the comments. Well, if you're Apple, maybe you kill that now 10 year old lightning connector, just summary de-resolution it to get it off the grid. And then maybe you replace it with lightning too. Maybe USB-C or even Thunderbolt, or maybe something that could take the iPhone and us forward into the next 10 years. So the absolute easiest thing for Apple to do is just make lightning faster. Lightning 2, electric boogaloo, Wikipedia it. If you use the OG Lightning, you're stuck at OG Lightning speeds. But if you use Lightning 2, you get five gigabits per second, maybe 10 gigabits, 20 gigabits if Apple's feeling frisky. Now, everyone on tech Twitter and tech YouTube would just lose our collective minds. Of course, of course. Even though there is a non-trivial set theoretics intersection of people who both complained about the iPhone being locked to proprietary Lightning connectors instead of USB-C, while at the exact same time, demanding Apple hard switch the Mac back from USB-C charging to the proprietary MagSafe connector. But hey, the nerd heart wants what the nerd heart wants. I'm just not gonna even go all giant green rage monster about it because I don't think it's at all likely or more to the point, I think if faster lightning was the sum total of Apple's ambitions for the next decade of connectors, they would have just done that last year with the faster ProRes engines and faster storage controllers there would be absolutely no reason to torture creative pros, the exact people Apple's targeting with so many of these new pro capabilities with a connector that's still so incapable. Not if they didn't have something better, significantly better on the horizon, especially because Lightning 2 would only solve for the speed problem and that only affects a very small group of power users. It doesn't solve for the convenience problem that affects a much larger group of mainstream users, the ones who really just want one standard plug, one standard cable to rule them all. You know, Ashkenaz, Kapatula, USB-C, Kapatula. And I beg you no pardon, because the European Union, who you may remember from such regulatory cock-ups as the browser ballot, cookie disclosures, and GDPR, they're just pushing for USB-C to be required on all mobile devices. And that wouldn't mean that Apple would have to switch from Lightning to USB-C. They could also just add USB-C as well as Lightning. And more on that in a hot supersetted minute. And who knows, maybe the US government will also make similar demands as part of their recent big tech plan of attack. And by that, I mean their plan seems to basically be attack. So just switching from Lightning to USB-C seems like the obvious answer then. Just the super easiest, barely an inconvenience of solutions. And by USB-C, to be 100% crystal clear, the letters represent the type of plug. So USB-A for old computers, USB-B for old peripherals, USB-B mini and micro for old mobile devices. And the numbers like USB-2 or USB-3 represent the capability, like data transfer speeds. Even though USB just keeps changing what those numbers mean, probably because they're in a heated feud with HDMI over who can be the absolute worst plug authority on the planet. But either way, by USB-C, we're talking specifically about the shape of the plug. Even though, yes, every time Apple has switched an iPad from Lightning to USB-C, it's also come with an increase in speed as well, barest minimum up to five gigabits per second. So realistically, USB-C would solve for speed, but also for convenience. You wouldn't have to keep a specific cable around just to charge your iPhone, not anymore. You could charge it with the same cable as your iPad Air, your Nintendo Switch, your partner's Google Pixel, whatever. You could use that cable between devices as needed, maybe even only keep one cable with you to travel with. We could potentially achieve true port peace in our time. And the funny thing is, the hilarious part of this is, there's a multiverse of madness out there where Apple switched to USB-C instead of Lightning 
all the way back in 2012 to begin with. I mean, the same team at Apple that developed Lightning also pretty much just handed the C-Spec over to USB as well. Apple was working on the iPhone 5 back then, which was gonna be way, way too thin to fit the old 30-pin dock connector, the one that they'd switched to from Firewire almost 10 years before, the one that they were just completely beyond based over rewiring and cross-wiring just to keep up with the more modern protocols. And there was already a ton of talk from a ton of companies about replacing the old USB-A standard and just nuking USB-B mini and micro variants from orbit at the same time, just mass driving them off of other electronics and out of existence. But surprise, surprise, Apple doesn't all the time play nicely with others and has just less than zero patience when dealing with the slow pace of standards bodies, like negative patience. So the USB-C movie had a ton of other writers who'd submitted various drafts and proposals, but Apple's connector team came in and just handed Intel a script and said, basically make that. Even knowing at that point in time, there was just no possible way it'd ever be ready for the iPhone 5. Maybe the MacBook Stealth, the one port to rule them all 12 inch MacBook, the one they ended up shipping is just the MacBook in the spring of 2015, and as the very first USB-C only laptop. But Apple just was not about to wait two and a half years more than they absolutely positively had to for the forum to finalize USB-C not with the iPhone 5 on deck. So that team also made Lightning and they made it in the Apple way, which means slightly more water resistant, an Audi instead of an Innie, so it could be slightly smaller for even thinner devices in the future. But most importantly, even more standardized than USB-C would end up being and way, way better managed. Apple did screw up on the initial transition by just not having extra cables and adapters ready and available, at least for the first couple of weeks after the launch. And that made people who were already just beyond angry about suddenly being deported to Dongletown just to keep using their 30 pin car connectors and iPod boom boxes, it made them full on apoplectic. But 10 years of sticking with the same 30 pin was legitimately a long time. Lightning was inarguably a quantum level leap ahead and no one, no one had to worry about which lightning cable had what data rate or charging speed, and no Google engineer had to personally test and review each and every one just to see if it would fry the phone or hopefully not. And yes, sure, true, Apple made money from licensing dock and lightning and its associated chipsets through their MiFi or made for iPhone program. But the reality is it's never been more than pocket change compared to their massive, massive iPhone scale profits. If Apple just wanted the money, they could make way more of it selling Apple t-shirts online or checking Tim Cook's sofa cushions. They also switched the Mac from MagSafe to USB-C for a few years and more on that in a hot minute. So proprietary really isn't a religion, like a financial religion, it's pure product pragmatism. And what MiFi really gave Apple was the one thing they value way more than money and that's control. If Apple controls the lightning chip, it's not like they control spice flow on Arrakis, but on a device with a battery as small as the iPhone, with no need to plug in computer peripherals, it means no one ever had to worry about a cable working or worse, damaging the power management system. Just, you know, the shoddy quality of the materials used for the cables breaking and maybe shorting out because for some reason, we just can't have affordable braided cables from Apple already. Anyway, when 2015 rolled around and USB-C finally shipped with a 12 inch MacBook, there was just no pressure, zero pressure to push it to the iPhone. Partially because it had only been three years since the initial lightning switch. And if you made people switch again and just double dongle up at that point, they'd have cut you. But also because lightning had already become pretty much ubiquitous thanks to iPhone sales volumes, USB-C was still a nightmarish hellscape of quality and compatibility issues. And all the rest of the real world was still mired in USB-A and the mini micro damnation anyway and Apple couldn't do anything about any of that other than contribute slightly to the whole entire mess with USB-C charging cables that were frustratingly data anemic. Anyway, if Apple was gonna switch the business end of Lightning to USB-C as well, arguably the best time to have done it would have been the fall of 2017 and with the iPhone 10. It had been five years since the 30 pin transition and Apple was already gonna just flip the tables on the iPhone with an almost complete modern redesign, including including Qi standard inductive charging. So why not dumpster fire lightning along with the home button? I mean, the iPad Pro was gonna make that exact same switch anyway in the fall of 2018. But no, 
Apple's team weighed the pros and cons, by which I mean the pros and controls, and they figured the switch made sense for a much bigger device, one that was meant to be used much more like a traditional computer and would benefit from being able to plug into all of those traditional computer peripherals. But it just wasn't anywhere nearly as compelling for a smaller device like an iPhone that barely plugged into any peripherals and where Lightning had a big enough ecosystem, far less complexity, partially because of far less capability and way fewer quality and power management issues already. So for the iPad, Apple chose compatibility over control and for the iPhone, just completely verse visa. Even though, yes, Android phones were already standardizing on USB-C, Apple saw it more as a leap that wasn't quantum at all, as more of a step sideways than truly forward. And there just wasn't anything else to really force the issue. Which brings us to 2021, when Apple announced the iPad mini was moving from Lightning to USB-C, and then immediately hard trolled every single Creative Pro on the planet by delivering ProRes to the iPhone 13 Pro without any way to deliver ProRes from the iPhone 13 Pro, not anything faster than Lightning still stuck at half a gigabit per second. Enter compelling need. And there's now an inarguable reason to make that change. So could Apple finally, the rock level finally, be ready to switch from slow Lightning to fast USB-C? And yes, sure, absolutely, but I just don't think they will. Much as I hate it, I think Apple sees USB-C as a six-year-old standard that may be okay for a few more years, but just isn't something Apple wants to invest a similar decades-long commitment in, like they did with the 30-pin and with Lightning, for the next 10 years. I think they wanna give the people more, and yeah, maybe hold on to that control where they can for more. Which is why I also don't think they'll switch to flat-out Thunderbolt either, much as I would personally love it. All caps, get down on one knee, marry it, and birth a whole generation of cyberpunks, love it. Because Thunderbolt is another protocol that Apple worked on with Intel, basically taking light peak, focusing not on optical, but on good old copper, and productizing it into something they could combine with USB-C, starting with those 2016 MacBooks Pro. And yes, Intel has eased up on Thunderbolt licensing, if not Thunderbolt certification, but USB 3 and USB 4 both include support for dual moding in that spec. And hell, Apple even brought Thunderbolt to the 2021 iPad Pro along with the M1 and can just go up to a blistering ProRes ripping 40 gigabits per second over Thunderbolt. But that would mean surfacing external PCIe lanes, adding a Thunderbolt controller to A16, the way they added two to M1 and three to M1 Pro and Macs. And unlike a Mac or an iPad, Apple still fights for every millimeter of volume inside an iPhone and every milliamp of draw on its power system. And we haven't even seen Thunderbolt on an Android phone yet, where they'll try to spec wreck each other at every single opportunity. And Thunderbolt also isn't really any fresher than USB-C, which is why I think Apple's just gonna keep it regulated to their non-ultra mobile pro level devices, the ones that really benefit from Thunderbolt peripherals in a multitude of ways. And yes, thanks, I hate that too. But the idea of Thunderbolt, the idea of Thunderbolt is still compelling. More specifically, the idea of supersetting USB-C is super compelling. That's what some Android phones do already with their high-speed charging systems. You need their proprietary cable to get the quick adaptive super warp turbo speeds. But if you don't have that proprietary cable handy, you can just fall back on any generic peasant USB-C cable cannibalized from any other device, except an iPhone. But at least you can fall back on that generic peasant USB-C cable, and that is beyond compelling. So on this Earth Zero of universes, Apple could make Lightning 2 and just so happen to use USB-C as the plug. That way, anyone buying Lightning 2 as a brand knows they're getting a cable that is 100% designed to just work with their iPhone. But if they don't have it handy, they can use, wait for it, any old generic peasant USB-C cable in a pinch. It'll make us nerds ecstatically happy and maybe even get the EU and DOJ just all the way off Apple's backs about it, just completely off of those things. And I don't know if that would reduce confusion or just add to it, like be the best of both worlds or just the absolute worst, but you tell me in the comments right below the like button. Then there's something not quite as super easy, but maybe significantly more convenient, especially for people with accessibility needs like low or no vision or motor skills, something that doesn't require a tiny plug gets jammed into a tiny port with tiny pins that can get all gunked up. Something, I don't know, maybe magnetic, 
maybe just like MagSafe. Yes, the exact same type of connector, a huge swath of tech nerdum just celebrated Apple switching back to from USB-C on the Mac. I mean, kinda, because Apple left it so that we can still do data transfer and charge through USB-C on the Mac, but you all know what you did. Either way, anyway, MagSafe on the Mac, then and now, uses magnets for alignment and pins for power transfer. On the Apple Watch, where it's technically not called MagSafe, but it so super is, it uses magnets for alignment and inductive coils for power transfer. Because the magnets not only make sure it stays connected and doesn't slide off, but it makes the less efficient inductive charging process just slightly less, less efficient. Same for the very different type of MagSafe Apple introduced for the iPhone in 2020, magnets and coils. And there have been rumors about MagSafe for the iPad as well, but it already has a smart connector for keyboards, which is basically MagSafe on easy mode. Point being, MagSafe can bring the juice, either through pins or inductively, but can it bring the data? Because so far, all we've seen is that keyboard functionality on the iPad smart connector and like case color recognition on the iPhone MagSafe. In other words, nothing to light our data dreams on fire, much less our ProRes fantasies. And yeah, hell yeah it can either through pins or purely wirelessly, like through some combination of ultra wideband and point-to-point -point Wi Wi-Fi, or even some proprietary Apple protocol, much of which would also make Apple totally exempt from the EU's proposed USB-C regulation because it only covers physical ports, not inductive or wireless. And there have been rumors of the iPhone going full on, full off, physically portless for a while now. Same with Google's Pixel and other phones. Some crazy ass Android concepts have even shipped port loose and connector free for years already. Now, me personally, I'm still all Bowser Galactica, all OG Matrix. I want a hard line. So do most creative pros and developers who spend so much time debugging so much code. It would also complicate device recovery and restore like DFU mode. And that's rumored to be the exact reason Pixels didn't go wireless years ago already. But Apple just did remove the service port from the watch and is apparently testing some hot new wireless connector internally now anyway. So maybe that is all just becoming way closer to a solved problem. And going MagSafe would also reduce hardware complexity, improve water resistance, mainly because people keep getting the ports wet and then plugging them in, causing shorts, and allow for that incredibly intoxicating, totally addictive magnetic thunk when you hook it up. Just thunk, I love it. It's the same amazing feeling I get when I hit play on Nebula. That's the streaming service where I post all of my videos, including extended versions of my interviews, like my recent chat with Apple's VP of Silicon and the Mac, as well as my reviews, my explainers, my exclusives, including a new studio tour series where I'm going through everything I use to make videos. Part one with all my camera gear is already live and part two with microphones is coming up next. Also my documentary on how the original iPhone changed the lives of all your favorite creators and just so much more because on Nebula, I have the luxury of making videos that don't have to be optimized for YouTube or for this channel, but where I just know the nerdiest, most hardcore of you will absolutely love them. Plus, Nebula just added an Android TV and Roku app, as well as Apple TV and Picture in Picture on iOS, all ad-free, sponsor-free on Nebula, and bundled in for free when you sign up with today's sponsor at curiositystream.com slash Richie, or click the link below. And right now, today, because you're watching this video, you can get CuriosityStream on surprise super sale for 42% off, less than 12 bucks a year, less than the price of a USB-C dongle for the whole entire year. And that includes their thousands of amazing documentaries and series like Myths and Monsters, which takes you on a journey through the mythic landscape of Europe, revealing the origins of the most famous legends of all. It is the absolute best way to support educational creators directly and just the best damn deal in streaming today. For over 42% off CuriosityStream, less than 12 bucks a year, and Nebula bundled in for free, just click the button on the screen or go to curiositystream.com slash Clicking on that button really, really helps out the channel. And so does hitting up the playlist above for way more on everything Apple has coming our way in 2022. So hit up that playlist and I'll see you in the next video.